8.30. So I think we'll um, get started. Um, so firstly, welcome everybody to today's webinar. This is the first IMRI webinar of 2021. Um, my name's Kate, I'm the Community Engagement and Events Coordinator here at IMRI. And as I'm sure you're all aware, with COVID-19 restrictions, we've had to take the majority of our events online. Um, so we started our webinars. I'm sure you're all very familiar with webinars, but if you do have any problems, then please just pop a little message in the chat. Um, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a chat icon. If you click on that, it will bring up a separate panel on the right-hand side of your screen and just type any, um, any issues that you might be having in there and I also invite you to pop any comments that you might have in there as the webinar progresses. If you have any questions for our panelists you can use the Q&A icon again down in the, at the bottom of the screen if you, if you tick on that um, it will bring you up the option to um, submit a question and at the end of the webinar we'll have a chance to ask your questions to our panelists. Um, so um, I'd like to welcome our panelists to today's webinar um, of course, the subject is about fruit and fiber and how what we eat can have a positive um, impact on our bodies and on our um, brain as we age. So we have Professor Karen Charlton. We have Distinguished Professor Xu Fong Huang. We have Clinical Professor Jan Potter and Professor Eleanor Beck. So welcome to all of our panelists. Um, there will be a recording of today's webinar and I will send that through to everybody who has registered um, shortly after the webinar. Um, and very quickly, for those of you who don't know IMRI or you've heard of IMRI, but you're not quite sure what we, what we do, it of course stands for the Illawarra Health and Medical Research Institute. We're a not-for-profit charity and our goal is to support health and medical researchers within the Illawarra Shoalhaven region. Um, our goal is to bring our scientists, our doctors and our health professionals together to help to solve some of the biggest challenges that we're currently facing. Um, and all of our, our researchers work really hard to find better ways to prevent and treat disease and illnesses such as cancer, diabetes, um, mental health and uh, dementia, just to name a few. Um, so I do encourage if you're not familiar with us, please jump onto our website, www.imri.org.au um, to familiarize, familiarize yourself with who we are and what we do. And of course, please reach out if you have any questions. So I think uh, we should get started on our webinar. Um, as you know, the title of today's webinar is Fruit and Fiber, the ingredients for a healthy aging brain. So we've all heard about um, your stomach having a brain or listening to your gut, follow your gut instinct. Um, where does this idea come from? Um, can you tell us a little bit about the connection between the gut and the brain? Um, Karen, I think you might be best placed to answer this to begin with. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kate. And um, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so yes, this is an interesting kind of topic because we've all heard about you know, listen to your gut, gut instinct. But nowadays you can't really turn around without hearing the term gut health. Gut health seems to have got into the mainstream and seems to be a bit of a current buzzword. We see and hear this term all over the place from scientific articles to health bloggers, to Instagram influencers that my daughter follows quite closely, um, to adverts for yogurt, vitamins, whatever. So gut health, is a little bit of a, a, a buzzword, but I think it's important to put into context what do we actually mean by the gut, first of all. Um, often we think about the gut maybe just as our stomach. Um, you might get people saying, oh, the terrible pain in his gut, or he has a beer gut, but really the gut is not just the stomach. The gut is a major organ. And I'm actually going to share a slide to try and explain this. Um, a little bit easier. Uh, so let me just share my screen and show you a slide that will hopefully explain it a little bit better. So if we think of the gut, we can think of um, essentially a tube 
Um, it's a hollow muscular tube. It starts at the oral cavity from the mouth where food enters and it continues through the pharynx, the throat, the esophagus, stomach, intestines, right through to the rectum and anus. So it's a, a continuous tube, if you like. Um, of course, there are various accessory organs that assist this tube or this tract where enzymes are secreted. Um, so the digestive system as a whole also includes things such as the liver, the saliva, well, the saliva glands in the mouth, the liver, the pancreas, uh, gallbladder, and these all have really important functions. But when we're thinking about the gut, um, often we think about the gut's main focus is just to digest and to process the nutrients and the fluid that we take in. And this is a really, really important function of the gut, of course. And without this function, when things go wrong, um, we need to be fed um, through other means and mechanisms. So, of course, the, the major function of the gut is nutrient and fluid intake um, and preventing malnutrition. But... Um, nowadays, we know that the gut has so much more to offer in terms of its functions. We know that um, inside this tube, at certain parts of the gut, particularly the large intestine, there are going to be millions, if not trillions, of bacteria. And these bacteria have really important functions um, in digestion of um, food components that can't be digested in other parts of the gut, such as fiber, for example. Um, but also these bacteria have really important um, roles in terms of immune function and um, assisting with our immune tolerance um, and also stopping the gut from being too um, hypersensitive to food allergens, for example. Um, the so these trillions of microbiota, which are inside um, the colon, um, will be important also for what we term the gut-brain axis. And Shifang will talk a little bit more about this. Um, but essentially, there is a signal from our gut to our brain. There is a communication system and a very effective communication system. So the gut microbiota do have a role to play in that because they produce um, short chain fatty acids from this undigested fiber. Um, and this provides a fuel for the intestine, for the cells of the intestine, but also assists with um, that, that uh, signaling to, to the brain. And then other um, neurotransmitters such as serotonin, which is the feel good um, neurotransmitter is produced in, most of it is produced in the gut and then goes to the brain. Um, so really important uh, functions over and above just nutrient and fluid uptake. So the, if you can think of the gut as this muscular tube and it has um, very specialized epithelial cells along its um, continuum, but then it has also layers on the outside. So it forms a really effective barrier to invasion by pathogens, which are harmful things uh, that we don't want to get into our, our, um, our system. So, Getting back to your question then of, you know, let's go with our gut feel. Um, there are hormones produced by the gut that go to the brain. These hormones that tell you when you're hungry, these hormones that tell you when you're full. Um, this comes from hormones produced in the gut and then travel to um, the brain to tell the brain um, you know, we need to eat now. Of course, we don't always listen to those hormones and often we eat when we're not hungry and so on. Um, but hopefully that's given you a little bit more of a feel about where this, you know, listen to your gut. Um, there are a lot of nerve cells um, that are also involved in the gut. So those butterflies you feel when you're nervous, if you're having to go to the toilet a lot just before a, a speech, um, these are um, impacts on on the neural neuronal system. So hopefully um, there is some scientific basis be to, um, behind these um, kind of listen to your gut or your gut instinct. So hopefully that explains it a little bit better. It does great. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, Chifong, did you want to um, talk a little bit about that gut brain axis in more detail? Oh, just um, just unmute your um, unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay. I think this is a really good introduction, uh, Karen, that covers 
uh, a, a lot of uh, extent. So you, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes. So as you can see there, really between the gut and, and the brain, uh, like Karen said, there are um, known pathways to the, today. We know how they communicate. Uh, particularly when you see the bacteria inside of the gut that can produce neurotransmitters, they produce uh, various metabolites uh, like the short chain fatty acids that can get into our system. Uh, then through the bloodstream, those uh, biochemicals can get into our brain because they are so small, there is past the blood brain barrier. This is the one way. Another way is to come back uh, from the brain can influence our, uh, our gut. This is uh, through the nervous system. In the medical term, it's called uh, neuro regulation and the neuroendocrine regulation, both pathways. Uh, therefore, uh, th those pathways are extremely important, also very, very tall. For, for example, with the aging that will change, uh, we're going to talk a bit more later, um, but uh, with the diet that can change very quickly within the weeks, you can change the gut microbiome in terms of the richness, the different types. We have done quite a lot of work in Emory here uh, with uh, um, a number of publications we're going to, we can introduce later when the come to the specific topics. Uh, now, Karen did mention about the mucosa. Here, as you can see, this is the mucosa. This is the epithelial cells Karen uh, mentioned. So uh, when they are, they are quite different, when you have the proper diet and, pro, and that will produce a thick layer that will prevent the toxic getting into your system. Uh, however, if the diet is not appropriate or something happened, that can be very thin. The toxic material can quickly get into your system. I might leave there uh, for now, uh, Kate, then uh, follow others. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Yifeng. So, so looking oh, at that slide, so is it possible to rebuild that gut layer by increasing the amount of fiber? <laughs> That you eat? Yes, exactly. We this year we have published a, a paper, paper uh, in the high impact journal based on three years of work. We know that certain fibers can uh, increase that uh, mucus layer. And uh, would you like me to share this, the slide to show you? Uh, that's that's a, that's a can can really increase. We can have we have the uh, the evidence mm -hmm. how thick they can they can increase mm -hmm. in terms of the time effect the dose effect. Mm. Therefore, it's a pretty very uh, solid data. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Great to have that evidence to to back up, um, you know, what we think about the gut. And it's great to know that you can rebuild that mucus layer by eating the right foods. If you have perhaps had a poorer diet in the past, you can rebuild that, which is which is great. But then that leads me on, I guess. Um, so if you're not eating the right, you know, you've said already that by eating the right foods, you can. Um, uh, help to prevent or to protect your, your body um, from um, disease and pathogens. Um, does that mean that if you're not eating the right nutrients, if you're not getting the right amount of fruit and vegetable and fiber, this can have a detrimental impact to your brain health? Karen, perhaps would you like to expand on that? Yeah, sure. Um, let's think about the brain. I mean, the brain is the most important organ in your body. It works hard to control all of your thoughts, your movements, your breathing, your heartbeat, um, your senses. So um, the brain, like other organs, requires a constant supply of premium fuel. You're not going to put um, low quality fuel into a Ferrari. Similarly, we shouldn't be putting low quality um, food into our body um, if we're trying to make our brain function to the best of its ability. So what do we mean by low quality food? Well, low quality food or low quality diets are really, unfortunately, the Western style diet. What do we mean by the Western style diet? We mean highly processed, highly refined foods that don't have much resemblance to their natural ingredients. They've been stripped of, uh, of nutrients. Um, and sadly, this is the kind of diet that most Australians consume on a daily basis. Uh, lots of uh, takeaway high fat, um, high sugar foods. 
Um, so it's been shown in quite elegant studies that if you, they used to be just giving this kind of diet to rats and see how, how rats perform. But I attended a webinar yesterday where a neuropsychologist was showing us really good quality evidence that if you gave young adults, university students that are bright young things, um, uh, a diet of, um, you know, a kind of McDonald's takeaway type of diet over four days, their mood constantly declined over the four days. So it doesn't take long for this kind of diet to make you feel sluggish. There have been studies in school children that, um, you know, cognition and memory and even functioning on, on school tests um, are not as good if you're having that kind of diet. So on the flip side, let's think positively now. Um, if we're having that kind of diet constantly, what's happening is that the free radical um, molecules, which are produced um, as a byproduct of the oxygen that we breathe, so they're a natural part of respiration, um, these molecules are highly unstable and they can um, they can damage cells, particularly neuronal cells in the brain. So if we're not providing antioxidants to combat that damage through our diet, you can imagine that the neurons in the brain over time are going to be damaged and not, not function um, particularly uh, as they should. Um, so let's think of what the brain's made of. The brain is predominant, predominantly made up of lipids or fat, polyunsaturated fat. Um, and about a third of this 50% of the brain weight is actually omega-3 fatty acids, so the long chain fatty acids. Um, and this is because of the antioxidant capacity of, the, uh, of this type of fat to really protect um, the neurons in the brain. There's been a lot of research about what is a healthy diet to prevent cognitive decline with age, because obviously um, everybody wants to keep their brain function as, um, uh, as uh, highly uh, functioning as possible for as long as possible. And memory is a, an important aspect of that. Um, so a lot of these studies have been difficult to decipher the results from because epidemiological studies actually follow people over time, see what they're eating and see what happens in terms of whether people have memory loss, whether they have mild cognitive decline or whether they eventually get dementia or Alzheimer's. So those kinds of studies are quite good um, because they kind of give us clues of what may be useful. So a, a diet high in the right type of fats, omega-3 and limiting animal fats is uh, associated with less dementia. But when you, when you try and do experimental studies, which are a higher quality of evidence, so you actually provide people with the dietary components you think may be protective, such as supplementing with fish oils for omega-3, for example, or supplementing with B vitamins. So in the epidemiological studies, B6, B12 and folate have been shown to be really important for maintaining cognition over, over time. But when you give these vitamins to people and then see what happens, uh, you don't get the same results, unfortunately. So there has been a, a really important study called the VitaCog study, and Jan probably knows about this, where they gave people uh, with mild cognitive decline B vitamins for over six years. And what they found at the end of it was that not everybody had benefits in cognition. It was only those people that um, had a good omega-3 status. So they had good levels of the omega-3 fats in their blood that actually had a benefit from the B vitamins. And similarly, some of the omega-3 uh, supplementation trials have found the opposite, that only in people that have good B vitamin status, and you can measure that looking at homocysteine in the blood, which is a type of protein, amino acid in the blood. People with um, high homocysteine, which indicates low vitamin B status, they had benefits from the omega-3 supplementation. So this is giving us some clue as to, you can't just take a single nutrient and think, okay, that's gonna protect my brain and all is good. Uh, it seems to be there's this sort of synergistic effect and we might come back and explore that a little bit further. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of an overview of, of what might be good and what might be not so good for our brains. Definitely, thank you, Karen. And I, and I imagine there will be lots of questions with um, 
specific what what types of foods would I should I be eating so yeah we can definitely touch on that later thank you Karen um so you've talked about um uh eating the right foods or the right type of foods to get the right nutrients to help to prevent um, decline in our, as we age. Um, it's hard to know, I think, sometimes what's normal, I say normal, um, forgive the, the, the term, but like, I mean, everybody ages, that's a natural part of life, but are there some things that um, are perhaps a bit of a, a bit of a red flag um, as as our parents or um, or our siblings or our friends that are are getting older that we should look out for. Um, is that to me, Kate? The question. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So I, I presume you mean in terms of memory loss. So hmm. all of us tend to lose a bit of memory as we get older. I mean, it's kind of part of the normal aging process. Similarly to other organs, your brain does kind of wear down after a while. So if you lose your car keys or you forget whether you've turned off the iron before you go out, or even if you forget the name of a family and friend, uh, that's kind of normal. But when we need to start getting worried is when perhaps somebody loses their way or they can't think of a common word or they might be less productive at work, for example, that might suggest um, signs of mild or early cognitive decline. Um, but by the time a person forgets their own address or telephone number, can't manage finances on their own, or even changes behavior such as withdrawing from social interaction, this could indicate the beginnings of dementia. And um, I'm very happy that we've got Jan Potter um, here today because she's an expert um, in dementia and hopefully she can answer some of the questions about this. So getting back to the question, what's normal and what's not normal? Well, dementia is not a normal part of the aging process. Um, dementia destroys the nerve cells and the neurons in the brain and prevents us from doing all those things that actually make us who we are and um, make us human, our curiosity, our create, create, creativity, um, our ability to communicate with others and so on. Um, so in terms of how big is the problem, about 50 million people around the world live with dementia currently. And in Australia, about half a million people um, live with dementia and it's really, a disease which um, is difficult to cope with, not only for the person with dementia, but also for their um, for their family members. So anything we can do to slow down the progression of memory loss at the early stages is where we come in in terms of our research. That's where we would like to have some dietary intervention. And hopefully that's where this talk today is going to lead us. Great, thanks, Karen. Jan, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I think so. I think um, a lot of the work that Karen and I have been doing together is focusing on trying to do some interventions, dietary interventions, nutritional interventions that are going to slow down the deterioration of the cognitive system. Dementia is a very common problem and an increasingly common problem. Um, the population in Australia are now becoming, we're aging more rapidly um, and about 50% of over 80 year olds will have dementia. And I can tell you clinically, my suspicion is that it's actually a lot higher than that because there's this perception in the older age group that memory loss is a normal part of aging and dementia is a normal part of aging. So it's only now that we're actually getting lots more interest in people with minimal symptoms, which is when we want to see them because there's very often a whole lot of general health advice that you can do that's going to reduce the likelihood of the dementia progressing. I think one of the things that's very interesting and hopefully we can explore it in a bit more detail is we tend with a doctor patient interaction is very um, it's often not what you think it is. So, for example, we know that from the PeriMed study that a Mediterranean diet is very good for cardiovascular health, but also for cognitive health. And we have a large um, immigrant population in the Illawarra. Um, and yet we, we did a, a, a lot of people from the Mediterranean. So we did a detailed study some time back with our dementia patients and their families, asking them if they 
could use a Mediterranean diet and explaining what that was. And many of them, particularly those who have immigrated from the Mediterranean, were absolutely clear and adamant that they were eating a Mediterranean diet and always had been. So we did a study where we sent dietitians out to the house to actually analyse and record what they were eating, and none of them were eating a Mediterranean diet. None, nobody had a high Mediterranean intake. The, the, the immigrants from European countries had a better intake, but it still didn't meet the requirements for a high intake. So I, I think as humans, we're very good at working out and knowing and thinking we know what we should be doing, but it doesn't mean we're actually doing it. And I think that's one of the challenges in research in this area is trying to actually get the reality of what's happening versus a very tightly defined clinical trial. Thanks, Jan. Gosh, that's really interesting to, to hear. Um, yeah, thank you for that. It's okay. Um, so, okay, so we know then uh, from, from, from your research that the, the foods that we eat can impact the way that our, uh, the way that we age now, the way that our brain ages. But Shifong, I wonder, could you give us a bit more information about on a molecular level, I guess, what's actually happening in the brain that's causing um, this brain function decline, decline as we age? Right. Uh, in terms of brain, uh, uh, we have a normal brain function. We can have uh, the brain does not function properly some, in many cases. Surely with the aging, uh, there is a high incidence of the problems. There are some problems for particular diseases like dementia, Alzheimer's disease, even a number of other diseases. Uh, it's not only limited in the aging brain, it can happen in the young age, even through the brain development at the, in the very infant stages. Uh, therefore, there, are, uh, the, in terms of a brain, there are certain period of time during our life are very fragile. For example, during the brain development, you need a proper nutrition. Uh, when the brain getting into the problem, such as uh, Alzheimer's disease, this including other diseases as well, like uh, psychiatric diseases, um, particularly the disease I'm interested, we are interested here in the schizophrenia, and also major depression. Uh, so then you say how this linked from a nutrition point of view. Today we talk about nutrition. We're not, not talking about the pills, specific chemical drugs. We talk about nutrition today. I think there are three important things we needed to mention here. They are quite common, actually share among many diseases. That therefore we call them relatively non-specific, they always exist. There are three things. Number one is the inflammation. It's not the huge like a fever that type, it's a chronic low-grade inflammation that exists in the Alzheimer's disease, dementia, um, severe depression, uh, schizophrenia, even bipolar. We have shown that, that uh, uh, in a number of uh, uh, projects. It's number one, inflammation. Number two is the high uh, oxidative stress uh, that produce these molecules is called uh, RS, uh, reactive oxygen species. Uh, and they are in the brain. They can cause damage like Karen just mentioned. The third thing is about the brain cell needed the nutrition. The brain itself through the food that can produce nutrients that always drop when the brain function is not no normal. Therefore, in terms of food and uh, the brain improvement, the nutrition are essential, important. Now, we are not talking about it, to my view, we're not talking about the nutrition can replace the drug. We're talking about two different things. But think about if that uh, internal environment has changed, we call it a homeostasis of the brain, also internal environment with that pathology there, if you are not only treat with the drugs, ignore all those altered environment, that will not be a very appropriate uh, thing to do. Therefore, nutrition coming to very important, essential for the brain function. 
So that's the pathology linking into the brain to my view. Therefore, uh, we talk, we're not just talk about the, what a diet, you know, Mediterranean diet, uh, et cetera. We can talk a bit more in the, in the following uh, sections in terms of uh, our work done in Emory in terms of dietary fiber. I'll leave that to you, Kate. Thanks, Shifong. So, so you're saying just to, just to reiterate or just to clarify the inflammation, oxidative stress, and um, for our nutrients. So we we as individually we have we can yeah. play a role in our in our own brain health by making sure that we're eating the right levels of nutrients that our brain needs to function properly. Absolutely. Um, that we're not taking them throughout. Throughout the whole life, nutrients, nutrition are always important throughout. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, when the brain is fragile, when the brain has the problem, that's more required. For example, when we get you getting uh, the, you know, the older, the, the aging is the disease. It's aging itself causing a lot of problems. At that age, then you should really look after your diet. Make sure you uh, look after yourself with appropriate nu nu nutrition. That's what I, uh, that's essentially important. That's why I'm thinking this type of talk is important. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Can, can I say something else? Hey. I think, I think um, especially with aging, one of the very um, interesting things more generally about nutrition is that we found that it's actually the quantity of food that you're eating. You really need a energy rich, high calorie, lots of protein, as well as all the vitamins and minerals. And unfortunately, what's been very clear worldwide, actually, it's not just an Australian problem, is that as we get older, in the, the younger parts of Western countries, uh, we talk about the metabolic syndrome where obesity, hypertension, diabetes is the problem. But actually, as we get older, it's undernutrition and malnutrition that is associated with most illnesses, most, most pathologies. Um, and unfortunately, despite years of research, we don't seem to be able to reverse that. And it's particularly upsetting to me as a clinician that we are still in a situation where about 50% of patients coming in to hospital over the age of 70 um, will be undernourished. And unfortunately, 70% of that group will be much more undernourished after their hospital stay. So although you can think that um, you can understand lots of reasons why elderly people might not be consuming enough calories, they have dentures, they might have difficulty shopping, they might have difficulty preparing foods. But even when we bring them into hospital and we provide the food, we make it worse. And, there's, and we understand all the reasons around that, but as a Western society, we as yet have been unable to reverse that, which is really quite surprising, I think. And almost every illness and the severity of every illness and the mortality, the deaths associated with those illnesses are much higher in an undernourished elderly person than in a well-nourished elderly person. So it's not just about the, 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 the microscopic, how much fiber, how much vitamins, it's actually about the whole diet itself that's really important. So can I ask um, if, so if, um, I guess speaking from personal experience, I remember um, my grandmother when she went into hospital, she didn't want to eat any what we would consider nutritious food. She just was, I guess her body was craving those high sugar foods. And um, I remember my my mum being very concerned that she wasn't getting any fruits and vegetables. Would you would you say, even though she was eating the hospital food as well, um, is that better than her not getting any nutrients at all? Yeah, I think, but the evidence is quite clear that if you can get adequate protein and calories into somebody, particularly when they're unwell, mm. that that will be beneficial to them. Over the whole course of, you know, the next 20 years of your life when you're out of hospital, the, the detail of what you're eating is important. Mm. But it's very, very crucial that the protein and calorie amount is adequate. Um, and so we would tend to encourage, especially my very elderly patients, I encourage them not to do your healthy, low fat, skim milk, none of that. Have fish and chips, have whatever you want, just get the calories in because your, your muscle loss, your falls risk, your immune function, 
everything is worse if you've got protein calorie undernutrition. Wow, that's really interesting. Thanks for that, Jan. That's okay. Um, we, we have had a, Ellen, did you want to say anything? I just wondered whether, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, well, I, I think I was going to talk a little bit more generally about the type of foods that we should eat. And I think um, one of the things that's really interesting, I mean, Jan sort of given us the segue to making sure we don't have undernutrition. Um, but what we understand also is that outside of hospital, as she mentioned, we really need to be looking more broadly at, at, at the variety of food that we have in our diet. And, you know, everybody kind of has a joke when you say, oh, the Australian Dietary Guidelines, and maybe somebody remembers that one of them says, eat a variety of food and, you know, don't eat too much of this and have a few more whole grains and fruits and vegetables. And one of the big problems we have is that that doesn't sound very exciting, does it? Um, it's actually way more exciting if I said to you, oh, we could have a pill or take this supplement or, or this will definitely make things better. It might be a lot easier to take than some of the, the things that, um, you know, people like myself, who's, who's a dietitian, might be encouraging you to eat from time to time. And I guess the answer, I think, is that both of those things could be important. So, for example, um, for the majority of us, and particularly those of us trying to avoid things going wrong with our brains and avoid dementia and look after ourselves, then we need to follow those dietary guidelines. Um, and and I'll, I'll share my screen with you as well as I'm talking. Um, but if we look at once people have got a problem, then maybe that's when we might need some targeted therapies that may be able to help as well. Um, and so I think understanding those, you know, two slightly different things is important. Um, we were talking about fibres and types of fibres, and I'm just going to uh, share my screen with you now. Um, Eleanor, can I just ask, is there a way that you can move your mic closer to... Uh, it's just... Oh, it's can you, not, this, I can hear that better? it's a little bit faint. Is that better now? Um, really. we, can still, we can still hear you. Okay, I'll just try and speak quite, okay. um, quite loudly. That might, might, might be part of the, the issue. Okay, so I thought it's worth talking about. I do have a slide telling us what we're supposed to eat, but I thought I might just give you an idea of what Australians might be having a problem with. And um, I think I'll just uh, start at the top there with vegetables, the much maligned vegetables. Um, and let you know that only set, in the last Australian survey that we had, only 7% of Australians were eating enough vegetables today. So those dietary guidelines where we're encouraging people to eat vegetables, only 7% of people were actually meeting that target. It's a tiny, tiny amount. As you can see, I couldn't even make a whole person, so I had to try and colour one in on my computer last night. Um, only 50% of Australians eat enough fruit, and you might have all seen a little bit of controversy in the media. I think it was only last week talking about juice and was it was a, was a healthy food. And it's a classic example where someone like um, uh, myself, who might be getting a little bit older, but still relatively fit and healthy, I would say, no, you really shouldn't necessarily have some juice because you're much better off to eat the fruit and get the fibre. And that might transition once we have an elderly person in the hospital who might not be eating a lot and we might want them to get some extra vitamin C from that fruit juice that might be helpful. Um, so there is that transition. Um, this, if you look at the bottom line, you'll see that I've changed the way the picture's drawn to just highlight, if we talk about whole grains, now whole grains are a whole food, they're not very processed, they not only have the dietary fibre that we're talking about, but they also have some other um, micronutrients, so some other things in them that we know are even better than just eating the fibre by itself. Um, and three in 10 Australians in that survey that I was talking about, eat no whole grains on any day that they were surveyed. So they eat zero. So that means that they're having things like white bread and maybe processed cereals or perhaps not even um, choosing many of their grain foods that they should be having. So only one in four of us were having the recommended amount. The recommended amount is only about three serves a day, which is like three pieces of whole grain bread. Or in fact, if you have a big bowl of porridge um, in the morning, you're gonna get most of those whole grains um, that you need. So we, we, I mentioned that Australian Guide to Healthy Eating and um, you can see that, you know, it's, it's encouraging us to eat lots of these fruit and vegetables here and other foods, but 
I actually, and um, this is currently under review over the next three years, we're going to get some new Australian guidelines. And I, I just thought I might share with you the Canadian plate because I think it touches on some of the things that we've been talking about. It very specifically is encouraging us only to choose whole grain foods. So things like the breads, the, uh, the, the brown rice, the wholemeal pastas, those kind of things. And you can see there's a few of those fashionable quinoas and uh, um, other grains in there. Look at this beautiful colour and it's something that Karen might touch on a little bit later on as well, but you know, beautiful variety of fruit and vegetables. But the other thing that it talks about is eating protein foods. So really clearly specifying that those foods are, are critical, but they don't always have to be meat. So they can include eggs or uh, fish or beans and legumes and nuts. Um, and of course, dairy products um, as well. So it's very, very important to make sure that we're getting that kind of variety um, in our diets. Great, thanks for that, Eleanor. Um, so you mentioned about, uh, actually, can I ask you just to um, unshare your, that lovely, thank you. Um, so, uh, discussing the different types of fibres um, and you know getting the majority of it from whole grain and, and fruits and vegetables. Um, can you tell us a little, so you said one in four, I think, um, uh, was it one in four, sorry, that didn't have any whole grains so, at all? Yeah, actually a little bit more than that. So um, it's really a, an important concept is probably that dietary fibre isn't just one thing. So the actual, the definition of it is, is the kind of stuff that you'll eat and it comes out the other end. Um, so that's the thing that can make our, our stools or our poo. See, it's fibre's not very fat functional because um, often if you go to a talk on dietary fibre, someone will show you a picture of our, our, the thing that's coming out the other end and that's not always seen as very nice. But bulking that up um, actually helps us. It means we're not straining. So even the elderly, uh, constipation is a problem and constipation will make things like bladder control much worse. Um, so it's very important for that. And the kinds of dietary fibres that are particularly good are the ones that come from our some of our grains, like our wheat grains um, so um, and vegetables. Um, those have got really uh, what they call insoluble fibre, which tends to make um, our stools a little bit better. Um, but the other type of dietary fibre that's really good, of course, is soluble fibre. And many people might know, oh, are oats good for heart disease? Or you see those ads on the packets that talk about cholesterol and, and oats. So uh, food like oats and, and a lot of some of our vegetables are quite high in soluble fibres. But the, the, the critical thing is for general healthy eating is that you want to have a variety of those foods. So... Even if you eat oats, you will get some insoluble fibre, but you'll get a bit more soluble fibre. If you eat vegetables or maybe some whole grain wheat bread, you might get more insoluble and only a small amount of the soluble, but you will get that variety. So uh, a simple message with those kind of foods um, is to eat a lot of them um, and eat a good variety of them. And you, you, you can't really go wrong uh, there. Great. So would it be it would be fair to say, as in I know that we're always told to kind of eat the rainbow when you're talking about fruits, fruits and vegetables. Similarly, with your fiber intake from whole grains, just to eat a variety. So a piece of brown, a whole grain bread for breakfast, and then a wholemeal pasta perhaps at, at dinner, and some. I don't know what else would what else would you? Yeah, I'm just um, I did prepare this just like just to remind people how much they're supposed to be having. Mm. So you are supposed to have three to six grain serves a day, and that a little bit depends on your age, of course, how much. And, and of course, if we have very fit, healthy training people, they can have many more than this, but this is the minimum to get their nutrition. Um, and at least half, probably a bit more, um, should be those whole grain variety. So it doesn't mean that if you um, love having a big fluffy white bread roll on the weekend with some you know, hot chicken and something on it, um, it doesn't mean that that's going to be some evil food. It just means that the majority of the grains you're eating should be whole grain. Um, and if some, occasionally they're refined, that's not a, not a disaster. Um, 
we want to have at least five serves a day of vegetables. And that's the one that Australians seem to be particularly bad at. And again, it's really hard to have five serves for dinner unless you actually don't eat much else. So uh, we really strongly recommend trying to get some of those in through the day. So um, even simple things like beans on toast, if you um, haven't got good access to really fresh foods all the time, um, making a salad to go with your lunch or putting that on a sandwich at lunchtime and then making sure you have at least half of your plate at night time as vegetables is a good idea and then a couple of serves of fruit a day. So that, that's kind of what it looks like in, in the food. Um, and if you do that and you do that with variety, then some of the sort of more targeted nutrients that here at UAW and, and Emory they're doing our research on, um, you're bound to get more of those nutrients in your diet um, just by having that variety and by moving that quantity of food. That's a great reminder. Thanks so much, Eleanor. Um, and you referenced um, Karen's research um, a few minutes ago about um, different coloured foods. I wonder, um, Karen, whether would you mind just um, letting us know a little about, bit about the research you've been doing into red and purple um, fruit? Sure. Thanks, Kate. Thank you for letting me talk about my favourite subject. <laughs> um, so if we think about foods, we think about carbohydrate, fat, protein, vitamins, minerals and so on. But foods, or some foods, plant foods particularly, um, have other components which are there to protect the plant while it's on the tree. So uh, protect them from sun damage, from um, other kinds of um, damage. Um, but these compounds are also beneficial to health. So we, th we talk about um, this whole group of these compounds as polyphenols. So they're not nutrients but they're called bioactive comp components, which means they're biologically active in the plant while it's on the tree, but also um, in our body. And this is just a, a diagram of showing you the, de the various um, subclasses of flavonoids. So people may have heard of flavonoids. Flavonoids is a class of polyphenols. Um, and there are six different subclasses of these flavonoids. And it's this one here um, that we have been working on for probably the past six years. And Jan Potter is one of our um, clinical investigators and um, has worked closely with us on, on this journey. So it has been a journey because we've learned a lot along the way. And I just want to give you a very quick synopsis of what we've learned. So the anthocyanin group, so all of these compounds have health benefits in one way or another. But in terms of what we're talking about today, we're talking about brain health and anthocyanins tend or uh, seem to have the greatest benefit in terms of potential to improve memory um, and cognitive function in older people. Um, so about 10 years ago, I met a scientist from Tufts University in the States, Jim Joseph, the late Professor Jim Joseph, and he'd been doing a lot of rat studies whereby they put rats into this water maze and rats don't like water, so they try and swim to a platform. And he found that if you gave aged rats um, that had a sort of similar aged brain to somebody that would have um, Alzheimer's disease, for example, so forgetfulness. If you put these rats in the water maze, the ones without, um, the, the younger ones would find the underwater platforms and they'd be quite happy in the water maze. And then when you put them in again, they would remember where those platforms were. So in those kinds of studies with the aged rats, um, if he fed those aged rats blueberries, um, that memory loss of not being able to find the underwater platforms was no longer evident. So this was kind of the clue to, um, to trying to replicate studies like that in humans. And that's where we began our journey. Um, I had a PhD student, Catherine Kent, and we decided to embark on a clinical trial with um, people that had um, moderate Alzheimer's disease. So these were Jan's um, uh, patients. We had 49 patients. They came in to Emory and they were either randomized to get a high anthocyanin um, cherry juice. So anthocyanins, um, I should have said, provide the blue, purple, deep red colors of fruits and, veg and some vegetables. So blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, black currants, um, 
found in red wine in, in certain amounts, things like red onion. Like red cabbage. Red cabbage, exactly. So they're and, quite- And red, red grains as well, okay. And, and some of the red grains such as um, sorghum, red sorghum. So they're quite visible actually. So it's quite easy to spot them because the plant gives you the color. So you just go, oh, Oh yeah, that, that'll be good for me. So we managed to get cherries from an agri-tech company whereby they'd managed to press the cherries into a juice because remember, cherries are only in season for about a month or two. So we needed to be able to preserve the anthocyanins and this company found a way to preserve them in the, in the juice without destroying them through heat. Um, and we embarked on this study, which took us a lot longer than we thought to recruit the numbers of, of people that we needed. So we gave people the cherry juice for 12 weeks. They were randomized to either the cherry juice or an apple juice. The control group got the apple juice. And lo and behold, we found that there was an improvement in um, a test called the Ravelt test, which is actually a test of remembering words that have been repeated to a person um, either immediately or after a little bit of a delay. And this was a quite groundbreaking for us because what we thought was we would see more of a decline in the control group, but we thought we would probably still see a decline in the anthocyanin group, but not as high, but we actually saw a benefit. So it, this kind of gave us, it, uh, well, we got very excited by it, let's just say that. Um, we've since moved on to other studies using different sources of fruit. So remember in clinical trials, you need to give a standard dose of anthocyanin. So we're not suggesting that you only eat cherries or you only eat blueberries, but we've been working with a, another fruit, which um, is called the queen garnet plum. And you can see that the queen garnet plum has the deep red or deep purple color all the way through the flesh. It's not just in the skin, um, it's all the way through the flesh. And this is a special plum that's been bred by the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, particularly to be higher in anthocyanins. So it's about two to three times the amount of anthocyanins in regular plums. So again, we could press this, puree it into a nectar, give our participants this. So we've done a, a whole series of studies. We've looked at healthy young people. We've looked at older people. We've looked at people with mild cognitive decline. And what I can tell you is that we're seeing really impressive results um, in terms of both acute. So if you drink a glass of this plum juice at the same time as having a high fat meal, um, the negative adverse effects that um, occur due to a high fat meal, such as uh, inflammatory biomarkers, such as decreased blood flow in the arm, this is attenuated um, by drinking this juice at the same time. We've also found in a, a recent study of people with mild cognitive decline that attend a memory clinic um, that if they take the Queen Garnet plum juice that we give them compared to an apricot juice, which we color purple so that people don't know which one they're getting, um, we find that inflammatory markers, so markers of inflammation, and remember Xu Fong said that having an inflammatory state is not good because that can damage the brain cells as well. Uh, we found that drinking the Queen Garnet plum juice for six to eight weeks actually lowered some of the markers of um, um, uh, uh, this kind of high uh, status of um, inflammation. So this is giving us some kind of clue. At first, we were just interested in the memory and the outcomes in terms of cognitive function. But now we're looking at what what is happening. And we think it's something to do with those millions and trillions of microbiota because the anthocyanins um, some of the byproducts do actually reach the colon and actually feed the microbiota. So it's a two-way relationship. Um, they also uh, promote the beneficial bacteria growth. So that's one of the um, sort of mechanisms. They, we know that they're good for vascular health, these anthocyanins in foods. So they lower blood pressure, they increase blood flow, and this is all good to um, increase blood flow to the brain as well. Um, so we're getting much more of a handle on 
the potential benefits. And I'll just give a plug that our studies are ongoing and we're always looking for people that want to take part, especially those with diagnosed mild cognitive decline, so that we can learn much more about this. And I might just also give another plug that we're actually working on a purple diet cookbook. So how can you include anthocyanins in your diet without having to eat you know, huge amounts of fruit? you know, just substituting red onion, for example, in recipes. Black beans are a great source of anthocyanins as well. So a lot of Mexican cuisine is high in black beans. So, you know, once you start looking for anthocyanins in foods, you can see them in, in places that maybe you don't really think about. So I'll stop there. I could talk for another half an hour on this, but I won't. Um, I'll just stop there. Thank you. Can I add something? Of oh, course. Please do. So I, I think it's really important for the, the, the audience to, to understand the magnitude of, of what we're talking about. Currently in dementia and dementia medications, which are listed by the PBS, none of those medications improve cognition. They all try to slow down the deterioration. So nothing is curative and nothing is restorative at all. And as, as far as my knowledge at the present time, there's nothing in the scientific world being developed that's likely to be curative or restorative. The, the positive finding that we found with the cherry juice study was an actual improvement in cognition. So that's really encouraging. I'm also involved in another research study with dementia patients looking at um, Chinese herbal medicines. And the phase two study that was done in China, again, showed an improvement in cognition. So and the, the components of that are mainly saffron, ginkgo, biloba and ginseng. But it's just I think it's and, you know, what I said before about more people dying in hospital if they're elderly and undernourished versus if they're elderly and well nourished with exactly the same antibiotics, stroke treatment, whatever. So I think it's really important the audience appreciates that, that nutrition is probably the bigger solution to the problems of aging than any medication that is has been developed or is being developed so, so I just wanted to point that out gosh that's incredible to know Jan um, that we that we really hold the key to our own health by choosing you know what what, what we decide to to eat. I know it's, it's I know it's not as simple as that it's a much more complex than that but that's that's really encouraging to know I think yeah um, so we do, we do have a few questions come through, but I just very quickly want to touch on, um, we mentioned the Mediterranean diet and how that was, um, is deemed to be perhaps the best way to make sure that we're um, consuming all the nutrients that we need. Um, and, and that um, in a study um, showed that people thought they were actually following a Mediterranean diet diet but in actual in reality they they weren't so can you just run I'm just aware of time and I do want to try and finish as close to 1 30 as we can because I know that everyone's super busy um but what sort of things should people be eating like, can you just give us an example breakfast lunch and dinner that would um fulfill all of our nutrition needs nutritional needs and I'm happy for anyone on the panel to take that question Helena yeah, well, I think you can start with some of the things that I had on the slide beforehand. So um, although I don't think people should be following rigid meal plans per se, because part of the really important thing in nutrition and part of what happens when Jan was describing the undernutrition is when maybe we don't enjoy food as, as much as we used to. So we might lose our taste a little bit. We might not eat as often with other people. We might not cook as carefully as we used to. Um, but still, having said that, it doesn't hurt to sometimes map out what we're doing and say, well, how am I going to get those five vegetables in a day? How am I going to get my whole grains in? Uh, do I need to shop quite regularly to make sure I've got fresh fruits and vegetables as much as possible? Or, or if not, um, using some other varieties of them, such as, as frozen, if we need to. Um, how can we make our plates look colourful? So I think having um, a little bit of protein at the three meals a day so whether that be egg or dairy products or um, some beans or then including small amounts of fish or, or meat as well um, I think then around that we need to put all those colorful foods that we described so a lot of times um, at certain stages in our life we might only need three good solid meals a day um, and perhaps have a bit of fruit or something small in between at other times of our life where sometimes people find have 
bit better to have smaller meals, it may be that we have to concentrate on making sure they have healthy snacks. So um, I do recommend going to the Australian government website, the Eat for Health website, and you can plug in there your age and it will tell you how many serves ideally. And then there's a whole list of foods that are a serve of foods. And you can kind of then work out, perhaps write down what you eat in a day and see where you're missing your foods. And then you might be able to make some improvements to that as well. Thanks very much, Eleanor. That's great. Um, somebody has asked, um, Karen, where where might people be able to access the the Purple Food Book? Is that it's on its way? It's not yet been published. Is that right? Um, watch this space. We're still testing out the recipes. Uh, my family are being <laughs> on my <laughs> test crash test dummies, and um, yeah, we're still trying to get that into a format where the recipes are are in fact what people would like to eat. Um, so. Yeah, watch this space. We'll okay. let you know when it's ready, hopefully in a couple of months. Great, thank you. And good luck with that. Um, somebody, EEG, um, they didn't give your full name, but wanted to know uh, what to do to help with inflammation. I'm assuming inflammation in the brain. Thank you so much for that question. I think we may have covered that in um, through the course of this webinar in that just eat a variety of food. Yeah, but I just want to highlight that I mean, while there might be some particular nutrients that are exciting when people are doing the research on those um, and, and they'll get, you know, again, watch this space, when we get information that may be affecting the brain, it's really inflammation in all of our body. And, uh, you know, for example, obesity is a disease of inflammation. And so remembering to do a lot of the healthy eating things that you can do, but also the healthy exercise things and broadly having a healthy lifestyle limiting the amount of alcohol that we drink. Um, all of those things are going to contribute. And part of the mechanisms that we're investigating are what goes on at that, that cell level or even at the level where we're talking about those barriers between the gut and the rest of our body. We want to keep bad things that might come from bacteria from getting into our bloodstream, maybe adding to that, um, that inflammation. Uh, and the way to do that is to have that nutritious diet. So there's not, a, there's not an instant cure, but there's certainly things that we can do to maintain that in a really healthy way. Great. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, somebody is, Greg, Greg has asked, how do we register to be part of the studies? I will, when I do a follow-up email to this webinar with the recording of the webinar, I'll include some links on um, how you can register to be part of studies. Um, I'll include... Um, information on the Australian um, the food guide, Eleanor, that you were talking about. And I'll ask the panelists if they think of anything else that they think our audience would be interested in to follow up and do some research by themselves. I'll include that in the follow-up email. And it sounds like I just thought I have so many other questions here that I'm just not going to be able to get to today. We're already three minutes over. Um, so I'm wondering whether perhaps another webinar might be in order to answer some more questions, perhaps more specifically around the food, the types of foods that we can eat. And you know, there's a question here about um, you know, someone who's immunocompromised, what kind of foods can they, can they eat? So I, I think maybe this is uh, in the interest of time, perhaps something that we can do, um, that we can cover another time. Um, so actually there is one very important question that's just popped up. Um, is red wine okay as it's red? <laughs> um. Uh, Eleanor's directly below me in this uh, panel, so um, I have to be careful how I answer this. Um, red wine is part of the Mediterranean diet. We cannot um, we cannot overlook that. Um, and it used to be called the French paradox. Why do people from the Mediterranean, especially the French that smoke so much, have such low heart disease? And you know, for many many years, it was thought that it was all to do with the red wine. Um, it's the way that the Mediterranean people drink red wine. So yes, red wine does have anthocyanins in it. Uh, it also has something called resveratrol, which has also been shown to be beneficial to health. But remember, alcohol can damage neurons as well, so the two might cancel each other out. But it's the way that we drink wine. Um, the Mediterranean Mediterranean diet has wine with all of the highly nutritious foods and the 
vast array of plant foods. So it could be that, again, we're looking at this synergistic effect that the wine helps the absorption of other things. Um, but by all means, um, enjoy a glass or two of red wine if that's what you like to drink. Great news. Thanks, Karen. Um, okay, look, so I think um, we're going to have to wrap up the webinar there. Thank you to everybody for all your questions um, and, for, um, and for your time today. A huge thanks to all of our panelists. We just couldn't put these webinars on and provide all this really valuable information to our community without you. So um, thank you again for taking time to, to participate today. Um, if anybody does have time um, from our audience, we do have a little survey um, that will um, come up at the end of the webinar. If you do have a chance, just two minutes, just to answer that for us, and we would really appreciate it. We want to continue these webinars, but we want to make sure that we're putting out content that you, that you want to see and, um, and hear about. So that would be great if you could do that. Thank you. Um, and... I think that's it from me. So um, watch out for the follow-up email and um, I look forward to seeing you all next time. Thanks again, everybody. Bye. Bye.